those strivers, the ones that are told and are expected to kind of move out once they make it, are staying here, opening up businesses and being a part of the culture that is a part of our community. There is something in between gentrification that displaces us and poverty level economic maintenance. To me, it's talent retention, making sure that we've got the tools to redefine and redevelop a future that we want to be in. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Well, Community development, it's a puzzle. Nowhere we can think of has done it perfectly. Choose any city and you'll find issues. But one thing's for sure, the people who live in a place are the ones most keenly aware of what's needed there, and yet they are usually the ones with the least decision-making power about how their communities develop and change, especially when they're poor or people of color. Majora Carter grew up and came of age in the 1970s in the South Bronx in New York, one of this country's toughest places at one of its toughest times. Since then, her neighborhood's seen billions of dollars of investment from all the usual sources, but very little of that has lifted up the people who live in her neighborhood. More often, it's displaced them or cast them as a problem to be fixed. Majora Carter long ago waded into this fray, deciding not to leave, but to stay and to do development differently. A self-described, quote, chick from the hood with zero experience in real estate. Over the last 30 years, she's led a fight against a proposed waste management facility, spearheaded the creation of a new riverfront park. She started her own consulting firm, received a MacArthur Genius Award, and a Peabody for her podcast. And in 2017, she and her husband launched the Boogie Down Grind Cafe, a hip hop themed cafe in Hunts Point, the Bronx, that survived and even thrived during COVID with a bit of help from Beyonce. Her book, Reclaiming Your Community, You Don't Have to Move Out of Your Neighborhood to Live in a Better One, is just out from Barrett Cola. Majora Carter, welcome to the program. I'm glad to have you. Ah, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Congratulations on the book and so much more. We're going to get into all of it. But we have to start where I think probably our, our audience last saw the Bronx, which was in news footage of a fire just this January. Tragic. Killed, I think, 17 people, eight kids. Years since 1977 when the Bronx was said to be burning. Well, I anyway felt both sad and furious that this was still friggin' happening after all this time and all this money and all this awareness. You wanna just share what was going through your mind? Look, my heart went out to the people that were there. And, you know, and just knowing the little that I knew about, um, you know, some of the buildings up there wasn't the best, but the bottom line is we've got a lot of those buildings, right? And that, in and of itself should tell us something about what are, what's the kind of quality of life we expect people in communities like the South Bronx to be living in. And is that all that, is that the best we can do? The answer for that would be no. There is something in between, you know, gentrification that displaces us and poverty level economic maintenance, you know, as, as evidenced by like the quality of some of those buildings um, that, we still have in this borough. And to me, it's talent retention, making sure that we've got the tools to redefine and redevelop a future that we wanna be in. Did you grow up thinking that you would stay there? No, of course not. I was planning my escape when I hit seven years old, when at the beginning of the, of the summer, I watched both buildings at either end of my block burn down. And at the end of the summer, my brother was killed you know, and because of the gang violence here. And I was like, I'm out, like I'm gonna use education and, and to get out and I did. But what we've been seeing, especially over the past several years, you know, are that the, the talent within our community, all those, those strivers, the ones that are, are told and are expected to kind of move out once they make it, are staying here, opening up businesses and being a part of the culture 
that is a part of our community. They are totally dismissing this idea that the nonprofit industrial complex like places on us, that poverty is a cultural attribute and, and neighborhood preservation is basically what's done in terms of development in places like this, that essentially says, well, this is what this community is. Again, inequality is assumed. So we're not going to set up the conditions for the, the talented ones to stay. We're going to make sure we're going to make sure that those that they get out of here. Yeah. And that's that. I mean, if, if you can still have buildings burning, given how many billions you write have been poured into the South Bronx, mm-hmm. right. where is that money gone? Billions of philanthropic and government dollars go into certain neighborhoods, but you know they'll go to things like um, very highly subsidized affordable housing. You know where there's homeless shelters and and for housing for very low income goes there. Um, pharmacies and healthcare. You know the lifestyle illnesses that are that are um, you know being also paid to treat. Uh, those those kind of conditions from diabetes and um, you know heart conditions you know as opposed to like really treating you know the action they they sort of treat the symptoms as opposed to the causes of what's actually happening in those communities. You have a problem with pharmacies and community centers when it's the major way for folks for billions of dollars of economic activity to come into a community that's basically not there to support people's traje- economic trajectory. Yeah, I have I do have a problem with it when it's banking on, you know, the fact that the 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 case that there's more opportunities for the people that are providing those services versus the people who are actually getting them and not and we're not seeing any improvement in health outcomes or educational attainment or anything like that in those communities because we're continue to concentrate poverty there. Yeah, I have an issue with that. So really, there's no trajectory in mind. There's fixing people in place in mind. And, and that's what you write about. And that's what you say that you felt um, in those times when you were thinking about coming or going from the Bronx. Talk yeah. about what, what got you to stay, what, what committed you to the place, and, and what you love about it. Well, um, I wasn't trying to, to come back to the Bronx, but I had, you know, started my graduate program at NYU and I needed a cheap place to stay. And the cheapest place was my old bedroom at my parents' house, period. And uh, but once I got here, um, I got connected to this uh, amazing um, young man who had actually started a community center um, or excuse me, a, actually an arts program in the community. And and it really I had no idea there were that many creative and artist folks like in the South Bronx. And I was one of them. So I was just like, oh my gosh. And so that kind of made me want to stay. And because suddenly I found a tribe. But then, you know, I realized that the city was planning on building a huge waste facility on, on our waterfront. And we had already handled an enormous amount of waste services and other types of, you know, noxious, environmentally burdensome places. That's when I realized like, all the arts and creativity in the world is not going to save us. I was struck with a really harsh realization that this happened because what's happening to our community because we happen to be poor people of color and thus politically vulnerable. And I was like, oh, you know, I can pretend I don't see that and just move on or I can be a part of the change I wanted to see in my own community. Now, it hasn't been easy and you write about how it hasn't been easy. Um, because you have been trying to sort of spearhead a, a different path. And you got in particular trouble using the word self-gentrification, which wasn't your term in the first place, but got you into trouble. Can you talk about why and how you think about that term today? I think it was just the gentrification part, you know, that people, it's just a trigger word for folks, even though self-gentrification many that got it were just like, oh my gosh, that makes perfect sense. You know, why do we have to like wait for the neighborhood to get, have, you know, folks from, from outside the neighborhood to get better? Why can't we enjoy what's here? It's like, yeah, I want a better neighborhood. Yeah, like here. And so, but then there were definitely others who were like, oh, she's just gentrifying it. And I'm like, no. And, and it was, it was fascinating because I think some people just heard gentrification and that was it, but we don't even use it anymore because it's just, it's just too much. And I, you know, it just gets in the way. Well, so to come back to the idea of reclaiming a community, you don't have to move out of your neighborhood to live in a better one. 
let's just dwell here for a little bit because it's complicated. Yeah. And I've been in the last few years, I think since we last saw each other, to a lot of places that were wrestling with this, where, mm -hmm. whether it was New Orleans after Katrina, where they said, this isn't recovery what we're seeing here, it's removal of, of the people right. who've lived here. Or, or Baltimore, where you saw, you know, a rebellion um, after a police killing really try to raise the issues of development in a community. Yeah. And I remember yeah. somebody saying to us on the show, it's not that we don't want development here. We just want to have a piece of it, a, a part yeah. in it, some say. Totally. So, so how do you facilitate that say when you government could say, well, we have community boards, we have surveys, we people just Sorry. don't show up to the meetings. Well, no, that's that's nothing. I mean, I would add what they want is, is equity, you know, period, as in the money, like not not the equity, the way progressives talk about it, because that doesn't create wealth for anybody. You know, the problem is that we've got this huge wealth gap, you know, based on the fact that there were entitlement programs, you know, starting from the 1600s for white folks in this country that people of color didn't get straight up. So it's real easy, you know, to say, you know, and I hear this a lot, like, oh, you know, you know, there's, there's, you know, we want to hear your, 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 your input into development. It's like, no, how about we like you help set us the access to capital so that we can actually do it. How about, um, you know, there's, you know, I mean, I find it so crazy. Um, let's see that there's a, an opportunity here for people to think about things like how, why do we let or it's made it so possible for folks that did have access at homes, like through like really hard times. And why is it so easy for predatory speculators to come in and pick that off of people, right? Because many times people don't really understand the value of their own property. That's one thing that we are actively trying to do. And um, it's so the part of it is just like, we are often let or no, we don't often, no one's letting it happen. But I think if you think about it, the way that predatory speculators have, have actually created, you know, like we're just like a piece, communities like ours are literally, we're like a little line item on their spreadsheets. So having persuaded you, people who live in the community that they're worth nothing, their property's worth nothing, because look, this is how it gets treated. Then you come right. in and say, I'll give you nothing for it. And that'll seem like something, but the developers do have a plan and they do right. see well, the developers value in there. absolutely have a plan. So to the little old lady, you know, who lives in a neighborhood that's a low status community and who's been watching it, like not get any better. So when someone shows up at her door and says, I can buy your house for cash, she's like, in this old crappy neighborhood, okay, I'll take it. I'll move back to the islands or wherever. But we don't, because I think that's one of the problems that we have, that we're not supporting our own communities to actually be able to own, to own. And instead we're talking about, you know, they just need another program or maybe they'll be provide some input into another developer who comes here. No. And that's why like the wealth gap is as large as it is and why it's keep, it will keep growing unless we're actually addressing this. We've got a new administration coming in in the city with Mayor Eric Adams. We have a governor running for re-election, Kathy Hochul, in the state. What tools do government agencies have at their disposal to do the kind of work that you're talking about? You know, the same way that um, if you commit a, or are accused of committing a crime, then you get, you know, if you don't have um, access to counsel, the government will provide you with one. Six-figure real estate deals go down in communities like the South Bronx every other day. When predatory speculators show up at the homes of people, you know, that don't really understand their asset or how to use it and basically cut a deal that is often for far less than what those people, what that house is, is, is worth. And they could actually use the, the equity in that house to do all sorts of things. But instead, our government all over this country, locally, everywhere, just lets those, those kind of deals go past the Department of Finance with nobody says a word about the fact that literally no one says like, are you sure you know what's, what's happening here? Like that, that literally this asset that you're, that you're selling for far less than it's worth 
because we could see some of the tax records that some of the sales that, that, that have happened around here. Do you know that, that, that this is what it's worth or something like that, just so to let people know, but instead they just pass muster, they just go right away. And um, you know, essentially what happens is that those, that family's asset is just lost. So a public, a public real estate defender. Yep. So <laughs> a public real estate defender. I love that. I'm totally going to write that down. Though. That's what, and then, that's shorter and better. What about financial institutions? What exist and what do you need? You know, I do think that if there was more opportunities for the, um, you know, for, for banks to kind of look more, I think, deeply at like what creates a, what's a good risk then they would see that there's like the same way that like, you know, Grameen International like actually looked at alternative ways of assessing someone's risk and their willing and their ability to pay back something. That's, I think is gonna be really interesting to, you know, to support people as they start thinking about asset, um, you know, development for their own projects. And so that's really good. What about that question of self-perception, of culture, of, of talent in a place? Because it doesn't feature anywhere on anybody's application form the talent that's in their, in their family, in their bones, in their community. What we're trying to do is help people see that, that that talent was actually nurtured in a community like ours. And it would be amazing if we could actually take it back and work to create more opportunities for us to, to benefit from their talent and also for others to see the future the, of, of others that look just like them, you know, doing this kind of work. Um, so I think that's what's super important, you know, about it as well. So that takes us to the boogie down grind. Talk about it. Where'd, where'd the idea come from? As an early real estate developer, we just asked folks like, what were they leaving the community for? To where where do they spend their money? You know, what what um, were their hopes and dreams and aspirations for the kind of community they wanted to live in? And what came back were things like cafes and bars and restaurants and cool places to hang out. And so we acquired these two pretty cheap leases, you know, with uh, from, from a, a landowner in the community, and we tried to get a coffee shop to come in <laughs> and you know like we won't say the name of the really big one who's basically said no that a market's too emerging and uh so they didn't come and we couldn't find anybody else to to open up a cafe so we decided to do it ourselves and so yeah it was it was all our money that we um you know had saved up we decided to call it the boogie down grind and really make it an homage you know to the creativity and the talent that in the community that literally birthed hip hop. Once we built this beautiful space and, you know, when it came and so we'd like literally plastered the walls with these the, like early hip hop albums. And it was just super fun and really kind of cool, you know, and that's when the community, they were seemed to be enticed to stay because there was someplace cool that, that literally spoke to them and that they were allowed to be them their best selves. As a matter of fact, it was insisted upon. Um, so there were people decided to come and do open mics and um, you know credit repair workshops, uh, book readings, um, music events. I mean, it was this tiny little space and it was really, really awesome um, to have something like that where folks were just sort of like, I didn't know we could do something like this in the neighborhood. And then COVID hit. And then COVID happened. We closed down like everybody else did for a while, but we got a grant from the from Beyonce's foundation and we decided to use it to make some outdoor seating. We literally like hung, you know, artists work, you know, from between a lamppost and a tree. And, you know, they that's it was, it was an outdoor, you know, exhibition like every other day. Um, you know, we put a microphone on the corner and you know, folks would come and do their their all their artistic things. It was it was truly amazing. And and it was so beautiful because one of the things that makes me super happy about that was that, you know, people were just like coming up to us and saying things like, you know, I haven't heard that much joy on on that street corner. In years. And I was like, yeah, like y'all did that. I mean, we just made the space, but the community filled it and their joy is what's overflowing out of it. How do you address the fact that it's inevitable that developing a place develops the interest of outsiders in coming right. and, and mining what's there? There will be folks coming in, but if we can kind of set the conditions so that folks the talent that's already there 
can also participate, then we have a, a community. We have a much more you know, economically diverse ecosystem that creates opportunities for people that are already there who can then you know, be like, okay, yeah, 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 we know this, this aforementioned you know, chains here, but guess what? There's another one you know, that wants to do this. So does that look like economic diversity requirements, regulations? We don't need to necessarily create you know, another like legislative lane for that. What we really need are just opportunities for people within our own community to be a part of the ownership trajectory. Sometimes it's as simple as keeping the family's home within the family. And, you know, and I could say that like, because my own family didn't keep my family home. And that's, and it's, that's still like, it's so painful, you know, to me. But the thing is, I think we've got an opportunity to sort of like create more of an understanding that if we just keep what we got, that's actually a good way to start the trajectory for many folks in our communities to build generational wealth locally. So you're talking about a different model for community development. You're also talking about a different model of community investment, um, mm -hmm. investment by community members in community facilities and enterprises and businesses. And, and one that you have kicked off is a project you're calling Bronxlandia. And it's in an old, beautiful, abandoned train station. What's your vision there? It's going to be a $2 million redevelopment where we're taking this historic, you know, Cass Gilbert designed rail station. It's the same one, uh, the same architect that did the Woolworth buildings, one of my favorite buildings in the world. And um, so he did these little rail stations, you know, yours truly actually acquired one a few years ago, and we're going to transform it into an event venue. And uh, so it's good. So I, I really, I want it to be like the best music venue ever. And it's going to be, that's, that's my, that's my prayer can be part of that? Who is part of that so far? So um, the SEC did a really wonderful thing where they changed their regulations um, that allowed for just non-accredited investors so that not only super wealthy rich people with lots of assets under their belt could invest in real estate and other types of business projects, but ones that were not, but who wanted the, the, the same kind of proportional rate of return for their money to be in those in those deals. So what we're doing is a part of our capital stack is definitely going to be, you know, part of the, um, uh, you know, for a, a crowdfunding investment platform where we'll up give an opportunity to folks, you know, for as little as like about two hundred and fifty dollars, you know, have a, a a stake, you know, within the development of the of Bronxlandia. We often ask on this program, you know, what is it that leads you to believe, or not just believe, but was there ever a moment in your life where you felt that the changes you believe in are not just possible, but happening? Gosh, um, I have so many experiences that remind me that things are changing and that they've always been right there because we took the time to recognize that our community was filled with talented people. We just needed to give it a place. To, to see itself. And because reclaiming, it involves retaining the talent that's already there to improve their own surroundings and their own economic future. Um, because there's always been value in our communities. And, and, you know, and we know that we could and should aspire to something that's economically and emotionally and spiritually meaningful to ourselves. We just have to give ourselves the opportunity to do that. Capital, not charity, that's what it comes down to. People under pressure need help to preserve the assets that they have and a leg up to give them a fighting chance to make more, especially coming out of a global crisis. It's good for the people, it's good for the country. That was the thinking coming out of World War II when the GI Bill passed with bipartisan support in 1946. It offered free education and low-cost housing loans as well as unemployment supports to millions of returning GIs. And millions took advantage, opening up for them a doorway to the middle class for them and their families. But African Americans didn't benefit so much. For them, Southern colleges were entirely barred. Education was still beyond reach for many who had to work. And housing? Well, the market was redlined. Financial institutions were still ruled by Jim Crow. 
in New York and New Jersey of the 67,000 mortgages backed by the GI Bill, only 100 went to people of color. The GI Bill, as it turns out, did more to exacerbate racial disparities than shrink them. But that doesn't mean we can't do it again. Do it right this time. People often compare the pandemic to a war, so how about it? And perhaps add hazard pay and job protections for those whose communities have fought the hardest and suffered the most. There's something to think about. We'll post my entire conversation with Majora Carter and make it available as a podcast at our website. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks for joining us.